I see that some of the folks already know what I'm going to ask them to do that are joining, and that's put their county <laughs> in the chat box. Very good. So they get some so, credit. Yep. So, yeah, if you're already on, and um, if you wouldn't mind putting the county that you represent, that not necessarily the county you live in in some cases, and uh, put that in the chat box, I'd appreciate it. And then just a reminder for everybody to um, – Stay on, uh, make sure you are muted um, for the time being until a little bit later on. We're we'll give Eric uh, his time to present and then we'll take whatever time's left over 15 or so minutes to answer questions. Okay, Eric? Yep, that sounds good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me go ahead and begin recording here. All righty. Let's see. All right, we're recording. Welcome, everybody. It is uh, one o'clock, and looks like we've got a good crowd already on, and we'll probably have a few more continuing to join us as we go. So appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, we have a fantastic presenter today, Dr. Oh. Rebeck, <laughs> uh, and he's going to teach us all about beneficial um Beneficials and some biological controls. Was that right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Eric. Um, I'm sure. going to mute myself, and then you should be able to share your screen. And when you're done, we'll uh, entertain some questions. Okay. Sounds good. Let me get my presentation up and running here. Okay, can everybody see my screen and hear me okay? No I problem. Can see, I can see you and I can hear you. <laughs> okay, all right. Yes. Good. Okay. Very good. Okay, so yeah, um, as David mentioned, um, I'm going to speak today on uh, beneficial insects um, and biological control specifically, um, how we can use these uh, what we call natural enemies, I'll get into that in a moment, um, to help us with uh, biological control of many different pest uh, insects uh, in our gardens and, and other landscapes. Um, my contact information is here. Um, I am a professor in the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology. Um, my uh, email address is there for any follow-up questions. Please feel free to uh, uh, send me any, any questions you may have that doesn't get addressed today. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then there's my Twitter handle there, which I'm, um, I'm, I'm trying as kind of an old older extension person uh, trying to get used to using Twitter a little more often. Um, so once in a while, you'll see me on, on the Twitter feed uh, uh, tweeting, but, um, uh, but if you wanna follow me, please, please do so. Okay, so we, before we launch into the, uh, the broader topic that we have on the agenda today, I first wanted to provide a definition of biological, biological control. Uh, many, there are many different definitions out there. Um, the one that is probably most correct, or at least uh, also succinct, um, is um, biological control is the use of any organism to reduce the abundance or the density of another organism. And density can be thought of as something like uh, the number of insects per unit area. So we could think of number of aphids per leaf or per, per stem. Um, we could think of number of white grubs occurring in a square meter of turf grass um, out in the, um, uh, like on a golf course or a, or a home lawn. Um, so that's what we mean, we, we refer to as density. So we're trying to drive down um, basically just the overall uh, number of, of pest organisms in our little patch of, of habitat that we're trying to manage. Uh, now, when we think of agents that can, uh, that can be used for biological control, we, we think of these, uh, they, they could be th thought of as what, what I like to refer to as the three Ps, the three Ps of biological control. Um, and again, these are often referred to as natural enemies. So I'll probably be using that term natural enemies throughout the presentation today. So those three Ps are predators, parasitoids, I'll describe uh, what that means in just a moment, and then pathogens. Uh, yes, insects can get sick uh, just like people, um, and sometimes there are some pathogens that we can use as biological control agents to reduce the number of pests. So let's take each of these in turn and talk about some examples. So we'll start with predators. 
Uh, so first of all, what are they? What, what do they do? Well, in, in the insect world, predators can be either adults or immature uh, insects. So, so all life stages, except for the egg, of course, because nothing's going on there except development. Um, and, and these are often what we refer to as generalists rather than specialists. So they have a broad host range, typically. They, they, they feed on a wide variety of different things. During the course of their lifetime, they will consume, uh, they'll kill and consume many prey items. They have to be larger and faster than their prey in order to subdue them and, uh, and, and, and consume them. Worldwide, the diversity of predator, uh, predatory arthropod species, um, insects specifically, uh, is about 200,000 species. So there's, there's a lot of them out there. Uh, both sexes, so females as well as males, again, immatures and adults may be predatory, uh, may, may exhibit predatory behavior. And then that last bullet point, they remove the evidence. What does that mean? Well, it means that after the predation event has happened, after an, a predator has consumed another insect, there's usually nothing left behind. So if we don't observe it directly, we don't necessarily know it's occurring in our garden or, or other habitat. So, so they remove the evidence quite, quite well. And some common examples of some different species of predators that we might find um, occurring outdoors in our garden habitat here in Oklahoma, or perhaps indoors, we might use in a biological control program, releasing them into a, a greenhouse environment, for instance. Um, these could include uh, lady beetles. So the convergent lady beetle is shown here. Uh, Hippodamia convergens is one of our native species of uh, lady beetles. Um, lady beetles can consume anywhere from 30 to 50, maybe more, um, uh, individual prey items per day. So if we're thinking aphids, um, each individual lady beetle that's out there is consuming 30 to 50 um, individual aphids uh, during the course of a daytime. So the more lady beetles we have out there, obviously the better. <clears throat> Another common uh, predator in our Oklahoma landscapes are lacewings. Uh, the green lacewing is shown here, Chrysoperla uh, carnea. Um, very beautiful insects. Um, you can kind of see why we call them lace wings just by looking at those, those wings that they possess. Um, but in this case, um, this, this particular species, the adults do not feed as predators. They actually uh, will feed on floral nectar. So, so more on that later. But it's the larvae of green lace wings, Chrysoperla carnea, uh, and other lace wing species. Uh, that are absolute voracious predators of many different soft-bodied insects. Um, so they'll, they'll consume anything they can pretty much uh, get their, uh, their mandibles on. As you see there in the picture, they have these large mandibles, which are not used for chewing, by the way. They look like they might be used for chewing, but those are actually sucking mouth parts. They uh, pierce into their prey. It might be an aphid or a soft fly or a small caterpillar, um, and they will suck it dry, uh, feeding on all the, uh, all the hemolymph or blood that's inside of that that host insect. So these are just voracious predators. Oh, they also may be um, uh, cannibalistic. They might feed on each other as well. That's how hungry uh, these little beasties are. Other predators include spined soldier bug, Pedesus maculaventris, one of about three predatory stink bugs that we get in North America. Um, this is um, really the only species we have in Oklahoma. Southern, extreme Southern Oklahoma, we, we may get another species uh, from time to time, but, but this by far is the most common predatory stink bug that we get. We normally think of stink bugs as pests, but there are some good uh, species out there as well. Hoverflies. Yes, that is a fly. That is not a bee or a wasp. Um, even though it has the same coloration uh, as a bee or wasp might, that warning coloration, um, in this case, the fly is totally harmless. It's, uh, it's a mimic. It's mimicking a bee or a wasp in order to uh, exact its own protection from, uh, from its own predators. Um, and it, the hoverfly in this case, um, and you can always tell a, a fly from other insects by the number of pairs of, of wings. It only has one pair of wings or two wings in this case. Um, other insects like bees and wasps are gonna have two pairs of wings. <clears throat> um, in this case with hoverflies, um, it's not the adults, once again, that are predatory. Um, they will come to uh, a floral, uh, feed on floral nectar and pollen, but it's their larvae, once again. 
uh, that are predatory. Um, so these are predatory maggots really is what they are. And they love things like aphids, as you can kind of see in the picture here, um, this uh, green peach aphid is being consumed by this predatory maggot, kind of cool. Minute pirate bugs, Aureus insidiosus. Um, they get the name minute pirate bug, minute because they are very, very tiny. These are very tiny predatory bugs. Um, and they use those piercing sucking mouth parts like all true bugs have uh, to feed on the, the insect blood um, of their, of their uh, prey item. And you can see it feeding on an aphid here. Uh, this particular species is used um, in greenhouse biocontrol programs as a predator of uh, things like thrips and aphids and other uh, small soft bodied insects. So again, a very good predator, but you, you may not even ever notice it. They're very, very tiny. These also love to come to uh, flowers to feed on nectar. So, you know, they're not always purely carnivorous feeding on, feeding as a predator. Uh, they can also feed on floral nectar and, and other, other uh, plant uh, tissues or plant, um, plant parts. Paper wasps, we often, they often get a bad rap because yes, they do sting, um, especially what we like to call red wasps, um, uh, like the Polistes, uh, this is probably uh, Carolinensis in this picture, um, but many different species of paper wasp in the genus Polistes, they are predatory. Um, so if they're nesting around your, your house um, and they're not like in direct proximity to where uh, you or, or somebody else might be walking out the door, um, you can you know, definitely knock those nests down because it could be a, a, a health uh, hazard from getting stung. But if they're up you know, higher in the soffits of your house or somewhere where you're just not gonna frequent very often, um, it's okay to leave them be because they are really good predators. They go after those meaty morsels, things like caterpillars and such that are out in our gardens. And uh, they'll uh, uh, provision their, their nest with those, with those uh, insect materials. So very good predators to be sure. All right, so if you, if you have predator, you have to have alien, right? And so this is where parasitoids come into play. Um, by the way, that term parasitoid, I told you I would define that. Um, they're they're, they're kind of like parasites, yes, indeed. And sometimes we might use the terms, um, might flip around the, the terms and use them synonymously. But um, parasitoids in particular, they definitely kill their host. Um, and so we use this term uh, in entomology in the insect world um, to describe this behavior. Other parasites don't necessarily kill their host, um, but parasitoids definitely do. And so that's a key feature to remember with that term parasitoid. So a little bit about what they are. Um, as opposed to predators, parasitoids are more specialized in their choice of host. So um, they, they tend to be what we call specialists. They have a, a narrower host range. Um, you know, they don't feed on as many things or, or attack as many things. Uh, these are insects that develop from eggs that are laid in or on their host. So yes, once again, the original alien, right? If you recall from the uh, late 70s uh, and 80s uh, film series, uh, Alien. Uh, certain, they, uh, mostly wasps and flies fit into this, um, uh, this group, uh, but there are a couple of other orders of insects that do have some members that exhibit parasitoid behavior, but predominantly we're talking mostly wasps and then a few uh, species of flies as well. Uh, they have to be smaller than their host. Um, that's because these insects develop within that host body. And I'll show some pictures here in just a second. Actually, you can see some pictures on the right of some common parasitoid uh, wasps that we might release for greenhouse biocontrol programs uh, for things like aphids and scales. Um, worldwide, there could be up to 1 million species. So just incredible diversity here. Um, these wasps are just enormously diverse, uh, just unbelievable, especially the wasps. Um, speaking of, even though they have that, that egg laying device, what we call the ovipositor, and they use it for um, um, laying eggs into their host, and, um, and, and it is an egg laying, it's an ovipositor, it, it's a, and we call these wasps, um, they're, they're not harmful. They, they will not sting people. There's, there are some rare species of parasitoids that will, but most of what we're encountering, most of what we might be using in a biocontrol program, uh, totally harmless to humans. So don't let that term wasp freak you out because uh, um, it, it, it doesn't mean that these are harmful to people. 
um, only the female searches for hosts. So when we're talking, um, uh, when we're talking about uh, success, uh, successful biocontrol programs um, and the sex ratios, males to females, we, we wanna try to be releasing more females into that habitat, into that garden or into that greenhouse uh, because it's the females that are doing the searching and laying the eggs, attacking those, those host insects. And they do leave evidence behind. So if we look closely enough, we can see that there's some evidence left behind in our garden um, where parasitoids have had some activity. And I'll show you some pictures here in a moment. Well, here's a good one. Um, so that's a tomato hornworm. So um, if you're growing tomatoes, you may already be experiencing a tomato hornworm this year. Um, my garden thankfully has kind of somehow avoided uh, being attacked by them yet, but the, the summer is still young. Um, anyway, the hornworms are, are uh, and there's a wide variety of species of different hornworms too. Uh, they're attacked by different species of uh, Cotesia wasps. It's the genus Cotesia. Um, they're in the family Braconidae. And what's happened to this particular uh, insect here, to this hornworm, is it's already been parasitized. So what we're seeing on the outer uh, integument of this insect are not eggs, but actually uh, cocoons or pupae. Um, of the, parasiti the parasitic wasps. Those larvae have already developed within the body of the uh, hornworm, uh, feeding on, uh, in, you know, non, uh, feeding on tissues and organs that are, that are not gonna uh, immediately kill the insect, that they want to uh, prolong the life of that host insect long enough for them to complete their development. But ultimately that host insect will die. Um, and so they've chewed their way out, they've spun these cocoons, and then if you can see in the bottom inset picture there, um, that's an adult Cotesia wasp emerging from uh, the cocoons. So, uh, so we definitely uh, uh, have this going on all around us. So look in your gardens next time you are out in the tomato patch and you see some hornworms, uh, look for this uh, evidence that's left behind. That's a parasitized uh, caterpillar. And while it may still be alive, it's gonna die soon. And because it's been parasitized and uh, fed upon, it's not feeling very well, right? You wouldn't feel very well if you were consumed from the inside out. They're, they may still be alive, but not for long, and they're not going to be feeding much on tomatoes anymore, if at all. <clears throat> uh, other uh, parasitoids attack aphids. Um, so there are some aphid specialists, and I'm not going to get into the full uh, uh, diversity of parasitoids here, but others might specialize on mealybugs. Others might specialize on scale insects. Some specialize on caterpillars, like we were introduced to the Cotesia wasps in the previous slide. Um, so Aphidias species and some others, like Aphelinus, uh, these are some species of parasitic wasps that specialize on aphids. And you can tell that an aphid's been parasitized. Um, maybe not immediately, but certainly within a couple of days of that egg being laid inside of that aphid, the aphid tends to start to swell up. So it's going to not look really aphid-like anyway. It looks more like an aphid balloon. Um, and eventually it dies. So it changes color. It gets bigger, more plump. Uh, and then the adult uh, parasitoid, once it's developed, that's after it's pupated inside of that aphid, it's going to chew its way out. And you'll see a, a nice hole that's left in the uh, in the uh, carcass of that, uh, of that aphid. At that point, we call it, and the aphid's totally dead by that point. At that point, we call that aphid an aphid mummy. Okay, it's been, it's been parasitized. I mentioned flies can also serve as parasitoids. Um, and yes, they certainly can. Um, tachinid flies, the family tachinidae. Um, if you are interested in conserving monarch caterpillars, for instance, you may be well aware uh, that there is a genus of tachinid flies that actually uh, specialize and attack uh, monarch butterfly caterpillars. And so, um, you know, that can be a bit of a concern if we're trying to boost the numbers of monarchs by providing some uh, milkweed habitat in our, in our backyards or our gardens. Um, but, um, you know, by and large, um, these, are, these are good insects, right? They're attacking primarily caterpillars and some other uh, insects like some true bugs. Um, I think I've got a, in that picture down in the bottom right, that's a leaf-footed bug. Um, and you see the eggs are laid right on the head of that insect. Those, those white oval uh, eggs are laid on the head there. Um, and those will hatch into larval flies that will um, uh, tunnel into the, into the actual insect and then um, feed as parasitoids, consuming that insect from the inside out, completing its life cycle within. 
And then the third P of the three Ps are pathogens. So like us, um, we, um, can, uh, we are susceptible to many different pathogens. Of course, we've got this pandemic roaring with COVID-19 at the moment. Um, and there are specific pathogens that also make insects sick. So let's take, uh, just talk about these in general. Uh, pathogens do tend to be uh, rather host specific. Um, so kind of like parasitoids, they, they don't have a wide uh, host range necessarily. Uh, pathogens can include bacteria, fungi, viruses, protozoans, and nematodes. Um, and we normally think of nematodes as plant parasitic uh, uh, pests, really. Um, th things like root knot nematode and such. Um, but there are some beneficial nematodes that feed exclusively as, uh, as entomopathogens or insect killing um, um, organisms. They make insects sick and ultimately uh, those insects die. Some are able to penetrate through the cuticle um, themselves or usually through orifices. So things like the mouth or the anus or, or the spiracles, the breathing tubes um, on this, um, or the openings to the breathing tubes on the sides of insects. Um, others have to be ingested by the insect itself. Um, what do they do? Well, they certainly can kill the, the host uh, insect, but they can also reduce the fecundity or the ability of that insect to reproduce. Uh, they can slow the growth of that insect or even shorten the lifespan of that pest insect as well. And they do leave evidence behind. Uh, in the pictures on the right, you see some evidence here where those insects, um, those are the, uh, they've been uh, parasitized uh, on the top, that is a fungus that's, um, um, we'll, we'll cover the different types of fungi here in a minute, very briefly. Um, that's a, um, that is a metarhizium fungus that, um, also known as green muscardine disease. It gives that green coating to that dead white grub that's shown there. Uh, the middle insert picture there is the, um, that's an ins that's a insect pupa that's been attacked by uh, nematodes, those insect killing um, uh, nematodes, microscopic roundworms. And in the bottom, that's a, a two, three caterpillars. The top one um, has succumbed to a viral disease. So that's a virus that's attacked that. And it, it's hard to, um, you know, we, we can't really encourage pathogens necessarily to be attacking insects in our gardens um, or in our greenhouses. But, but fortunately, there are some products out there um, what we call bioinsecticides or, or microbial insecticides that use the spores primarily of fungi, uh, things like that metarhizium fungus, fungus I mentioned earlier um, in this product called MET52. There's another one called Bovaria bassiana um, and another one even, another fungal pathogen, Isaria fusarosa. can't pronounce that one, never mind, Isaria species. Um, that, uh, that they're, they're packaged in these insecticide uh, products. And basically it's the spores that are then mixed up in suspension. You put them in a spray tank, just like you would a chemical insecticide and you spray them out onto the foliage of a plant or you might use them as a soil drench. You drench them into the soil to control things that are, um, the pests that are, that are occurring below ground. Um, things like uh, fungus gnats, for instance, or root aphids. Uh, the, the bottom one there, scan mask, that's just one example, um, Steiner Nema feltii, that's one example of these nematodes that we can use um, that the, the cysts or basically the eggs are, um, they're kind of freeze dried, uh, they're put in um, these packaging with diatomaceous earth, and then you can mix that product up in a tank um, or in a, a bucket and you can use it as a drench. Um, I know of several growers who have had success against fungus gnats, for instance, um, which, um, which are hard to control because it's, it's below ground. Um, this is a non-chemical uh, method of control uh, to use in uh, fungus gnat control. They, they use it very successfully in their operations. It can be also used outdoors also. It's, I don't want to just give the impression that these are only useful in, uh, in greenhouse environments. Okay, so now that we know the players, let's talk about the strategies involved with biological control. So, there's really three, but I'm only listing two here, augmentation and conservation. The one I'm leaving off is importation or classical biological control, where we might go to the um, evolutionary origin of a pest insect that's been introduced to North America or somewhere else. We go to that origin and we look for these natural enemies that help keep that pest organism in check. It helps regulate the populations of those pests 
in its native land, where it's, where it's um, originated. And then we take those natural enemies and we bring them to North America or bring them uh, again to wherever we're having that pest problem. Um, and uh, and we, we release them for control of, of those pests. And there's lots of examples of successes using that. Um, but you know that's out of our ability as homeowners, as, as just backyard growers, right? Um, that's mostly um, university and, um, and federal researchers that, that do that kind of work. So, but there are things that we can do, uh, other strategies of biocontrol that we can employ in our gardens and um, our greenhouses. So the first of these is augmentation biocontrol, what sometimes is referred to as traditional biocontrol. There's two ways we can do this. There's inoculative, where we might release fewer natural enemies early in the crop cycle, trying to stay on top of the pest population before it really even becomes a problem. And that's a key. Um, we oftentimes people that they might try biocontrol and it fails for them. It's because there's just too many pests. Um, and we have to reduce that pest abundance or density first with some other method, maybe chemical, and then introduce the biocontrol organism in an inoculative manner. Another way is uh, inundative augmentation biocontrol where we inundate that pest population with large numbers of natural enemies and release them as needed. So those are two kind of different ways um, within augmentation biocontrol, two different methods that we might use for, uh, uh, in, for this purpose. Now, things that we can do as, as gardeners um, is to uh, promote conservation biocontrol. We are trying to conserve the numbers or the, uh, the abundance of these naturally occurring, what we might call resident natural enemies that already occur in our landscapes. They're just, for whatever reason, they're not attracted to our gardens. So we wanna try to bring them into the gardens, getting them closer in contact with the pest organisms uh, in our gardens uh, in, in other landscapes. So how do we do that? We provide the, the adult natural enemies particularly because they're the ones that are mobile uh, for the most part, we provide them with resources, okay? And those resources could be food for the adults. So think things like nectar and pollen, floral nectar and pollen, um, places to um, uh, set up nesting sites or overposition sites, or just providing some shelter from you know, the heat like today and, and the next couple of days are gonna be in the, in the hundreds, right? Um, and so, um, so, so insects can get overheated too. So we want to maybe uh, provide some shade, some favorable microclimate, some shelter from those adverse environmental conditions. So there's a number of ways that we can, we can do this to conserve those, uh, those natural enemies that are already occurring naturally all around us. Um, and I'll have more to say on that conservation strategy in just a moment, but Let's turn back again uh, to augmentation. There's lots of well-known examples. Now I am gonna focus primarily on greenhouse biological control because um, that's primarily where we might use augmentation, although it can be used in agricultural crops and has been used in agricultural crops, um, you know, larger field settings outdoors. But um, augmentation, lots of well-known examples. So some of these names, if, if you're familiar with biocontrol, you might know of these types of organisms. The species in Carcia formosa is used um, as a parasitoid of white flies in uh, greenhouses. Um, Aphidias species I mentioned earlier, like Aphidias comini, are aphid parasitoids. There are even um, spider mite predators, um, and there's a lot of different species of spider mite predators. Um, there's uh, this this one's the old workhorse, Phytocyllus persimilis. Um, there's some background chatter. If somebody um, David, I think you have control. If you could um, just mute everybody's uh, uh, spe uh, speakers, please. Maybe, maybe I have control of that. I think you found it. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, so as I was saying, the, the spider mite predators, these are predatory mites um, in many different species. And, and the one that's listed here is kind of the, the most common well-known example of a spider mite predator, um, feeds on spider mites as a predatory mite. So not all mites are bad. There are lots of different predatory species out there. The challenge is 
Off, with augmentation biocontrol in particular, the challenge is that it often requires a large number, so a high quantity and certainly good quality of natural enemies. Um, and we also need to intensively monitor to make sure, so monitor that pest population to make sure that um, we're accurately timing the release of those natural enemies, so the proper timing, um, so they coincide with the availability of, of prey to feed on or, or hosts to attack. Um, and this, what this happens is it often results in routine releases. We, we might get into like a calendar application mode where every other week we might be just, just for the heck of it because it's two weeks later um, releasing natural enemies into the greenhouse. So this can get quite expensive over time, having to purchase those materials um, uh, from, from a, a commercial supplier of biocontrol agents and making those releases on a weekly or, or, or semi-weekly basis anyway. So this can get quite, a, quite expensive. And also, again, I mentioned the issue where if the pest population is too high initially, augmentation is not likely to work because we, they just, that those natural enemies we release just can't keep up with the number of pests that are there. So we need to start with low densities or low abundances of, of, um, of, in, of insect pests when we start the uh, augmentation program. So conservation, I mentioned again, we're providing um, um, more food or, or, or other resources to, uh, to those natural enemies, to the adult natural enemies. So you'll find in the literature, these are referred to as resource plants. We're putting these resource plants out into the landscape to provide that resource to those natural enemies. So I mentioned already nectar and pollen. Um, this has been um, studied quite well for aureus insidiosis. Again, that minute pirate bug shown in the upper uh, right picture there. Um, by incorporating flowering ornamental pepper into a greenhouse, for instance, um, where other ornamental or maybe even vegetable plants are being produced, um, you know, giving, some, giving up some production space to putting in the ornamental pepper uh, can certainly um, um, help uh, conserve those, uh, those, um, those, those insects like minute pirate bug that we might have released into the greenhouse for biocontrol. Some plants have extra floral nectaries. So these are basically um, nectar producing organs on plants that are not associated with the flower. Um, and so some of those types of plants might be uh, incorporated into a program to um, a conservation program to provide those resources, those nectar resources to, uh, to natural enemies. Sometimes even plant sap can be used. Um, the predatory bug Macrolophus pygmaeus, um, shown in the picture in the, in the bottom right there, uh, again, that predator, um, it may not just be a carnivore. It, it might also need some plant tissues to kind of sustain itself, sustain its, uh, its longevity, its, its lifespan. Um, <clears throat> so just a, a few examples here. Other approaches, well, we might think um, another conservation approach in particular is to just reduce or modify our pesticide use, especially our insecticides. Um, so if we can um, you know, either eliminate or at least minimize the, the use of chemical insecticides in our, in our landscapes, in our gardens, it'll go a long way for, um, for conserving natural enemies. Because um, yes, those chemicals not only knock out the pests, they also knock out the natural enemies. And quite often, the pests are gonna recover uh, quicker and earlier than the, than the natural enemies will. And you're right back at square one with that pest problem. Um, sometimes we may have to modify the light or the climate. So again, providing shade um, might be a good way to, um, um, a shade as a resource uh, to modify the microclimate to make it more favorable to survival of natural enemies. Um, sometimes plant producing chemicals, what we might call um, host plant volatiles, or even pheromones that insects produce, um, largely we refer to this um, in general as semiochemicals. They might be used to attract natural enemies into uh, a habitat. This has look, been looked at um, from a research standpoint and has been used successfully. Um, increasing the diversity of plants. This is a big one. This is where we as gardeners can really um, grasp and, and, and uh, use these methods of conservation in our own, in our own landscapes. So we're, we're trying to um, aim for a functional mix of economically important crops that promote natural enemies. Uh, and, and sometimes it might be non-economically important. It might be just planting something that is gonna produce a lot of pollen and nectar, for instance, for natural enemies and, and promote the, 
the longevity and the survivability and sometimes the reproduction even of those natural enemies. So again, we're, the, the end game is we're conserving naturally occurring natural enemies in our surroundings, in our landscapes. And if you want to learn more about that topic, because we're not gonna be focusing exclusively on that today, um, there is an extension um, circular E-1023, Conserving Beneficial Arthropods in Residential Landscapes. So this has a lot of pictures, a lot more details about the biology of some of these different predators and parasitoids in our landscapes, um, including spiders, right? I didn't even mention spiders, non-insect predators, but, um, but certainly arthropods. Um, conserving the, the numbers of these, these critters in our landscapes to promote biological control. So this one you can, um, it's not available um, on the pods um, system um, for um, print on demand, uh, but you can simply Google um, or whatever web browser you're using, E-1023, uh, and that should be your first hit. You can go ahead and, and uh, download it from there. It's not available in print just because there's a lot of color photographs and the um, uh, printing costs would be exorbitant as a result. So, uh, so anyway, that's, that's one resource that you can use. I wrote this with the help of a graduate student a few years ago now. <clears throat> um, also, the things that we do to conserve natural enemies, incidentally, also help conserve pollinators, right? Pollinators are attracted to flowers, for instance, that produce nectar and pollen, right? So, so the things that we're doing for natural enemies can also help with pollinators, reducing insecticide use, right? Definitely benefits natural enemies, but it also benefits pollinators as well. So, so we can think of just beneficial arthropods more broadly. It's not just natural enemies, it's also um, pollinators. Keep in mind that biological control is just one component of a complete integrated pest management program where we, where we might be incorporating multiple tactics to try to stay on top of our pest populations. So this pyramid here kind of shows you the basis, the, 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 the first step in IPM um, next to identification, correct identification of the, of the pests that you're dealing with is prevention. So trying to do things that we can try to prevent, uh, do uh, employ tactics and methods that'll try to prevent that pest from becoming a problem in the first place. So this usually comes with experience. Um, we may have had uh, problems uh, with uh, squash bugs in the past, right? What can I do differently this year to try to prevent squash bugs from being a problem uh, this year and beyond, okay? So that's what we're trying to think of first and foremost, prevent the pest problem from happening in the first place. And there are some tactics for doing so. Um, cultural management, sanitation management, the way that we're maintaining the health of our plants, the way that we're growing our plants, um, cleaning up crop debris or plant debris at the end of the season, uh, so it eliminates overwintering sorts and, or sources and sites for, for insects as well as for uh, disease organisms. There's physical and mechanical control. Uh, your thumb and forefinger is, uh, is, a, is an effective uh, physical or mechanical uh, a method of, 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 of killing insects, right? Squashing squash bugs, squashing squash bug eggs with our thumb and forefinger. Biological control is in here as well. And then at the top of the pyramid, um, yes, insecticides, chemical management is part of an IPM program as well. Um, but the idea is we try to use chemicals minimally and only as a last resort. So when all else fails, when the biological control, the physical and mechanical control the cultural management, the sanitation, the prevention, when those tactics fail, um, then it's time to use those chemicals, okay? But if we're gonna use chemicals, again, try to use them sparingly. And instead of using broad spectrum chemicals, things like seven, which knock out everything, right? The pests, but also the, uh, the beneficials, try to use more selective uh, materials. So uh, think for tomato hornworm, for instance, we could maybe try using, um, um, those microbial insecticides, like I mentioned earlier, those that contain the, um, uh, the spores of the fungi, like Bavaria um, or metarizium. Um, or even for, it's a caterpillar, um, if they're small and, and kind of young yet, um, we can use Bt or spinosad. Um, so again, more microbial type products that are, are a bit more selective in their effect on insects. They only really have an effect on that target organism, that pest organism we're trying to control. So with biocontrol, it can be challenging, right? 
but you're not alone, right? There are some uh, roadblocks to success. So these are things that are often reported as to why biocontrol did not work for, for some growers. Um, maybe the environmental conditions weren't right, okay? Um, yes, light, temperature, and humidity are important. Consider these are living organisms that we're releasing. And because they're living organisms, there's an optimal range of, uh, of environmental conditions that will sustain their life cycle right? So the light has to be right. Temperature and humidity, there's a range of, of effective temperatures that we can release and be confident in releasing those natural enemies into that environment. Same thing with humidity. Um, it, it can't be too dry, for instance. It can't be too wet either. It can't be too humid. So, um, you know, work with, my, my, my tip for success here is if you're going to be purchasing commercially available natural enemies from, uh, from the industry reps, um, and, and I'll, I think I have information. Um, if I don't, I'll remind me at the end of the talk to provide it because um, there's a number of different companies that we can um, work with. But um, work with that work with that company um, representative um, in how to best apply uh, that natural enemy. And of course, there'll be information that comes with it when you purchase those things. But if you have questions, things aren't working right, work with the representative of that company because they want to stay in business, right? They want to keep selling products. So they want they want biocontrol to be successful for you. Sometimes the natural enemy that we purchase or use might be a poor match uh, with the uh, pest that we're trying to control, or maybe even with the crop that we're that we're trying to control the pest in. So, um, so yeah, the crop means it, it, the crop is important, right? The natural enemy may not perform well on all types of crops, or even in the same species of crop, it may not work on all varieties in the same, the same way. Um, and of course you need to have a correct match between the natural enemy and the pest, right? If the natural enemy is not gonna feed on that pest, it's not, a, not the correct match. So, so you need to do your homework ahead of time, find out what's available for controlling you know, pests X, Y, Z, because the, 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 the different predators and the different parasitoids are, uh, and pathogens even are, are gonna vary. Um, if we are using chemical control with biological control, and many greenhouse growers do, um, and backyard gardeners, of course, um, the, the chemistry may be incompatible with the natural enemy. So, um, so again, those, those broad spectrum insecticides generally are just broadly toxic to, uh, to natural enemies as well as pests. So, uh, but you have to keep in mind that sometimes even reduced risks products can harm natural enemies. So um, if we apply uh, insecticidal soap, for instance, um, when natural enemies are active, that insecticidal soap, um, it's considered a reduced risk insecticide, but it's also going to have a negative impact on the natural enemies that come in contact with that wet um, product. So, you know, try to apply those reduced risk products when the natural enemies are not active. So, so think pollinators, right? Think we're, we're early morning or later in the evening applications when the activity of those beneficial insects dies down. Okay, because once these products dry, then it's 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 in general more uh, it's safer for those uh, those non-target natural enemies and, and pollinators. <clears throat> and then sometimes this is getting better. The industry is getting a lot better with producing um, high quality natural enemies. But sometimes you might get a bad batch. Work with the company. Tell them it didn't work. You you notice that a lot of them were dead right out of the box. Um, you know, work with them. They'll they'll work with you. They will send you a replacement and say. Our apologies, you know, bad batch, what, what have you. It happens, right? So, so keep that in mind. These are a number of things that can lead to unsuccessful biocontrol, but they are surmountable. We can overcome these problems. Keep in mind, um, as I'm in closing here a little bit, we're trying to um, build resilient systems. Okay, a garden habitat, it, it's a system. If we think about it from a, a systems approach. Um, it becomes more uh, amenable to using biocontrol successfully. So effective pest control is at the center of our goal here, right? That's, that's our aim. And what do we have to have in place um, to make this, this system resilient? Well, we have to have the right natural enemy, we have to have the right plants, and we have to have the right environment, okay? So take away any of these components and you're not going to get effective pest control. These are all important components of a resilient system that's gonna lend itself to successful biological control.
So does it mean we have to do some homework? Yes, it does, unfortunately, right? This is not just, um, uh, it's not rocket science, people, but it's it's certainly not, um, you know, it's not intuitive. So, so you definitely need to work with uh, industry reps, work with extension um, agents, extension um, specialists uh, to help you with, and, and other biocontrol practitioners uh, to help you um, um, implement biocontrol successfully. So in closing, I just want to show you, um, this is a snapshot uh, from, from several years ago now from my former PhD student, um, uh, Tracy Payton. Um, she, when, when she was doing her research um, in greenhouse biological control, uh, she put out a survey to some Oklahoma greenhouse producers. Um, and like most surveys, she didn't get a whole lot of responses, but she did get 13 just to give us a little bit of a clue as to how to frame her research questions for her, her dissertation. Um, but one of the questions on the survey was, what biocontrol agents do you purchase and release to control arthropod pests? And even though we had a low response rate, only 13, um, you know, the results were pretty telling. Only 60, per, uh, sorry, 60 percent of those respondents said they don't use biocontrol, okay? And that was kind of what we're trying to get at, you know, who's using it out there in Oklahoma as far as greenhouse producers? Um, and, and, if, and if they are using it, what are they, what are they doing? Another 40% said, well, they're only using lady beetles. And, you know, lady beetles, um, there are some, some pros and cons with using lady beetles for biocontrol. I'm not going to get into that right now. We don't have the time today. But, uh, but a complete biocontrol program shouldn't include just lady beetles. Okay, let's just put it that way. And then um, all other respondents, 6.6%. .6%, so a uh, you know, a paltry 6% of growers that responded said that, the, so there's probably like one person um, said that they're not, uh, sorry, they are using more of a comprehensive approach to biocontrol. So we knew that our work was cut out for us. We, we knew that we need to do more working with greenhouse producers to promote biocontrol in Oklahoma production. Contrast that with my uh, colleagues up in Canada. Now they had a a larger number of responses, mind you. They had about 97 responses. But I've been to Canada several times and I've toured some of these greenhouses. And I can tell you that they are way ahead of the curve. They are far ahead of us folks here in Oklahoma, our producers here in Oklahoma, in terms of using biocontrol. The framework of this survey um, from my um, colleagues up there uh, in, uh, in um, Ontario, um, the, the, the framework of the question was a little different, but they, they had about 50% of their respondents saying that they use biocontrol from start to finish. So beginning of the crop cycle to the end of the crop cycle. Half of those growers that responded, so about 50 of them, are using a complete biocontrol program from start to finish. Some are only using it at the beginning. Some are only using it at, the, at certain types, uh, certain times in the, crop, uh, in the crop cycle. But you can see from the pie chart here that about 75% of those respondents, so 75 out of the 100, are using biocontrol. Only 25 of those um, uh, or so did not use biocontrol at all. So you can see that the tide is changing. The, the, there's a lot more interest and implementation of biocontrol in production systems elsewhere in North America. We can do this here in Oklahoma. Okay, If, they, if we can do it elsewhere, we can do it here too. So this all comes down to a need for change, right? So yes, the chemical industry puts out new fancy chemicals all the time, right? Um, but the problem as we've seen time and time again with relying only on insecticides for managing pests is we eventually get rapid resistance development in pest populations if we're not using those chemicals properly, right? If we're using the same material, the same active ingredient over and over and over and over again, those that target pest population is going to eventually develop resistance to that particular product. And then we find ourselves, our growers getting into this pesticide treadmill, right? They're going to the next product and then they're going on to the next product and they're going on to the next product, um, kind of in a treadmill fashion here, trying to use uh, the, the insecticides to maximum efficacy, but eventually the efficacy of those products runs out because of, again, because of resistance development. So there are some drivers for change. Um, first of all, I, I'm very pleased to see this, that the market demand, so folks like you, consumers out in the, the real world are demanding more sustainable production. Sustainable doesn't necessarily mean it has to be organic, right? Even organic producers use chemicals if, if you're not aware of that. 
they have to be, they, they fit in a, a narrower range of products. Um, those OMRI, um, um, it's the governing body for, for organic pest management um, that, that will allow certain types of chemicals. But, uh, but, but sustainable production doesn't necessarily mean it's organic, okay? We're just maybe using less uh, of a chemical footprint, producing less of a chemical footprint. Um, there are a lot of environmental and health regulations out there also that are uh, helping to dictate um, this driver for change, the need for um, biocontrol rather than chemical control. Um, sometimes export requirements. So, so some of the, uh, the cut flowers or the, uh, the, the, the small fruits or the vegetables that we might be uh, shipping to another country, they may have even stricter regulations than uh, we have in the US in terms of chemical residue. Um, so this is another driver for change to try to you know, reduce our chemical footprint, find alternatives to chemical control. Um, and then if we are using chemical control, once again, I mentioned this earlier, just make sure that those pesticides are compatible with biocontrol. So, um, so we've looked at this, we just published a paper recently on this compatibility issue. Um, Tracy Payton um, and, and I um, looking at, uh, as part of her PhD work, um, looking at some common um, insecticides as well as fungicides that are used in greenhouse production and what kind of um, effects do they have on a particular parasitic wasp that she was looking at for her dissertation. Um, it was an aphid parasitoid, uh, Aphidius colmenar. Um, so we look at things like direct to toxicity, but even if that insect survives um, this, the, the chemical application, there might be some sublethal effects, behavioral changes that insect can't um, it, it can't navigate to the pest as, as well as it once did. Maybe it has an adverse effect on the reproductive capacity of that natural enemy. So these are what we call sublethal effects, and they are important in terms of a biocontrol program, the success of which. Um, so residues as well, we got to consider, you know, what effect do residues have on natural enemies as well. So again, last slide, building resilient systems. So we're managing the crop ecosystem, right? We're, we're not just trying to manage one particular crop and, and, and thinking of it um, linearly. We want to think this as a system, right? It's, a, it's an ecosystem out there. It's a, it's a, a it's a construed ecosystem, you know, it's, it's what we've created, but it's an ecosystem nonetheless. So what we're putting into that system, fertilizers, pesticides, um, you know, what effects are they gonna have on natural enemies? Um, what effects will supplemental foods, alternative prey and hosts have on those natural enemies? Um, so thinking along that, the, the lines of conservation biocontrol. Um, enhancing natural enemy survival, establishment in a crop, and their performance, uh, their functionality. These are important considerations when we're trying to implement biocontrol and the use of these natural enemies in our growing environment. Um, and this will all lead, if we're using it successfully, and it will take time, but it'll all lead to more, um, more cost-effective, superior, integrated pest management. That's what we're striving for, okay? So just a few folks I want to acknowledge for, um, uh, again, the, the data from Canada came from my um, colleagues up in Ontario, uh, Michael and Rose, and then um, Tracy Peyton Miller at Langston University now, my former PhD student, uh, for her work, um, background work on a lot of the um, uh, information that was presented here as well uh, for you today. Okay, so I will stop sharing my screen. And we can take any questions that might come up if there's time. Looks like we have about maybe seven minutes or so left in the time today. Yeah, thank you, Eric. So if anybody has any questions, you can throw it in the chat box, or if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask the question, well, that, that works too. So absolutely, open it up to questions. Fire away. It's Don. Uh, Hi, Don. Steep... Hi, nice, nice to see you, Eric. You too, Don. It's... What do stink bugs prey on? The predatory stink bugs. So again, they're they're quite generalist. Um, um, but anything um, that's kind of smaller than them, um, anywhere from caterpillars to other uh, bugs um, that they might be able to uh, attack. Um, really, it's it's kind of a broad host range. And um, so, so yeah, oh yeah, fruit tree bugs and pests and those kind of things. Yeah, yep, yeah, that's right. So so you know you can kind of envision these things as. Um, they'll, they'll attack a, a wide variety of different things in some different um, habitats, some different 
uh, types of systems from vegetable crops to, to fruit crops to even ornamental production systems. Okay, cool. So, so what else should we put on our tomatoes besides seven? Ah, good question. Well, of course, that's going to depend on what you're trying to control. Um, so kind of, as I mentioned earlier with tomato hornworm, um, I strive for using, um, for caterpillar pests in any environment, I'll use um, any product that has BT in it, Bacillus thuringiensis, I didn't mention that today. Um, that's another microbial insecticide, by the way. Um, it's a bacterium that makes, it's specifically active on caterpillars only. Um, it is also, it's a little broader um, toxicity, but, um, but it certainly can be used um, as a reduced risk material for, for caterpillar control. Uh, stink bugs on tomatoes, on the other hand, boy, I tell you what, um, last year, and I'm anticipating this year, I'm going to have a bad problem with stink bugs and so on my tomatoes. So um, what I'm opting for this year in terms of a more organic approach, more sustainable approach, I'm going to be using um, kale and clay this year once my tomatoes are, they're already coming on, um, and I'm just anticipating those stink bugs are going to find them pretty soon. And once they do, I'm going to use um, that kale and clay. Um, it's a product called Surround I purchased a while back. Um, that, that clay material, it dries on the, um, on the fruit and the leaves of plants as well when you spray it. Um, and it acts as kind of a, a feeding deterrent, a barrier uh, to feeding. I'm going to see how well that works. There's been some good reports of using that uh, as well. But so you'll, you'll kind of see from one pest to the next, it's going to be, it's kind of going to bury what you might be using. Could, could you spell that? that... Uh, yeah, kale and clay is, um, uh, here, I'll type it into the, the chat window here. Cool, thanks. Yep. Kale and clay. Uh, whoop, not kale lion. Hello. Yeah, K-A-O-L-I-N. Yep. And Surround <laughs> is one of those products you can look for. Um, I see someone asked if this uh, slide presentation is available to the Master Gardeners for their use. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You, yeah. So I know that you're that? recording this um, uh, this presentation, but um, but yeah, uh, just, just hit me up uh, via email and I will, uh, um, or I could send it to David also and uh, and you guys can uh, can use it uh, um, for your own personal use as well. No problem. Um, I okay. see there's also another question about um, predators that like spider mites. So um, yeah, these are going to be primarily predatory mites that we're talking about. And wh where they're used primarily in greenhouses effectively, they can be used in greenhouses effectively, uh, sorry, in uh, outdoor production systems as well in backyard gardens. Um, so things like um, Phytocyllamus persimilis I mentioned uh, earlier, um, there's uh, Californicus, there's, there's a, a whole slew of different predatory mites that are good for spider mites. So, um, so work with a, a company, and this reminds me here, um, forgot to send that last message, kale and clay surround. Um, ANBP stands for um, Association of Natural Biological Control Producers, I believe. If you just go anbp.org or Google ANBP, um, that will get you to their website. And it's, it lists all of the North American producers of, of biocontrol organisms, um, including those that provide um, access to predatory mites that will feed on things like spider mites. Um, you'll find a whole array of information there on all the things that are available to you for purchase. Um, and again, using them properly, We're working with those different companies to use properly. So, and, and if you want to look up that publication that Eric mentioned, the uh, Conserving Beneficial Arthropods in Residential Landscapes, E1023, that lists a lot of those insects and, you know, many, well, he obviously he didn't talk about nearly half of them, but it'll list a lot of those insects and give you a lot of information about, about what's required to, what, you know, to make them happy, I guess, right? Yep, that's right, that's right, to attract them into your, to your landscape. Uh, Rebecca asks uh, two questions. Is there an effective biocontrol for squash bugs? Uh, <laughs> short, short and simple, I will say no. Um, there, there are some insect predators that will attack the eggs of squash bugs, um, but they just, as, as you know, if you grow squash, especially summer squash in Oklahoma, um, these are pests that you're just gonna have to deal with. Um, and, and, and the natural enemies out there just don't do, we just don't have enough of them um, or their activity isn't strong enough against stink bugs to, 
to get a good to get on top of those those insects. So unfortunately, squash bugs are just among some of those select pests that um, that biocontrol will not work for. But there are a number of things that we can do non chemically even uh, for squash bug management. For instance, um, using uh, row covers to cover over the squash plants to um, exclude them from gaining access to the crop it is one method or delayed planting of squash waiting till July 1st um, instead of June 1st or maybe even late May uh, for planting our squash seeds um, breaking that pest cycle you'll have fewer problems with squash bugs down the line and you'll still have squash there's plenty of growing season left beyond July 1st in Oklahoma uh, and, and you'll have reduced pressure from squash bugs so those are just a couple of examples of chemical alternatives how close does a plant refuge area need to be to the area where you want to encourage predators and parasites? Very, very good question, Rebecca. Um, I would say get them as close as you can. And there's a diff lot of different ways that you can do that. You might plant a row of nectar producing plants, for instance, um, in your garden or surround your garden with a variety of different nectar producing plants that produce nectar and pollen throughout the growing season. So, you know, you wanna have some plants that are producing um, early spring, others into the later spring, early summer, into the late summer, early fall, etc. cetera. Um, and in that publication, E-1023, it does list a, a number of different um, uh, flowering plants that we could provide, and it does provide the different times of year that they flower. So, so you're trying to keep that resource, that nectar and pollen resource, um, accessible to natural enemies throughout the growing season. And, and in terms of how close it is, like I said, as close as you can, uh, surrounding the perimeter of your growing area, putting it in the landscape somewhere is better than nothing though, I will say that. Based on your comment about a, a, a list of plants, um, I'm sure that that's, you know, not comprehensive. <laughs> it's not, no, you're, you're uh, is, right. You're you right. know, our, I, I, and I know that there have been a lot of other colleagues across the country that have been kind of working on this too, but are you aware of any other publications or other lists that might expand that and help maybe help us, help guide us into what plants will attract to what types of insects? Yes. Beneficials? Yes. So um, there, I can't remember the publication off the top of my head, so we'll have to do some research here, but there is a, um, there's a fact sheet called um, Nectar Producing Plants of Oklahoma, I believe. It's either out of the horticulture and landscape Arch architecture department. Um, so it's either, either an HLA designation or it's an EPP designation, entomology and plant pathology. So I can't remember which department it came from, but it's a, a nectar producing plants of Oklahoma. I know it was recently updated. I believe I had a, I do so many of those fact sheets and updates on them, I can't remember. I think I had a hand in the, the recent revision of that one, but that, that I think has a more comprehensive list and then myself and some colleagues from Texas are currently working on, um, some of you may even be participating in this. It's a, um, it's a pollinator outreach, citizen science type uh, uh, program or, or project. This, we're in our second year now where we observe different pollinator friendly plants in our landscapes, report on the abundance of pollinators coming to those plants. And we're gonna try to develop a more comprehensive list of maybe 25 or 30 pollinator friendly plants for the, for the Southwestern US. Um, these pollinator friendly plant lists exist for other parts of the US, but we, we really don't have one for the Southwestern US. And so, um, so we're trying to get more data gathered uh, to generate that list um, here. So it's more useful. And if it's attracted to pollinators in general, my general rule of thumb is that if it's attracted to pollinators, it's also attractive to natural enemies as well. So it's okay. attractive to insects in general. I found it, it's EPP 7155, and I threw it in the chat. Excellent, thank you, thank you. And Roberta Berta asks, stopping ants in the home. <laughs> so we're getting a little off topic here, but um, I get ants in my house um, often too. And um, usually these are small little ants that people oftentimes refer to as piss ants, right? Um, they're, they're trying to find a, a moisture source or a sugar source. So some kind of food source or moisture. That's why they're getting into your home. Um, so I have problems with these usually in the, the spring, early summer. Um, what I find works most effectively are ant, ant baits, those little stations that you can put. Um, Raid, I think is the product I, I pick up, the, the brand name. I put these out in various port parts, primarily my kitchen. That's where the moisture and the, the sugar sources are. 
Um, and it takes a little while, um, but the bait that's in there, it allows the ant, it's not an ant trap, they don't get stuck in it, but they take that bait that's, uh, it's laced with an insecticide, they take it back to the colony and eventually that insecticide through their particular way of feeding, it makes its way to the queen. And then that insecticide ultimately kills the queen once she takes enough of a dose. And then when the queen of the colony dies, the entire colony dies out. So um, that's the best method that I can use, is, that I like to use as far as a you know, non-chemical um, approach, although technically it's chemical because it's a insecticide laden bait. But um, other approaches might be spraying the perimeter with a broad spectrum insecticide on the outside of the house where they might be getting in. Um, if you know where they're getting in, um, those are those are some of the more effective strategies. Again, this is not my area of expertise, the indoor pest control, but um, but these are some things that I find uh, helpful as a strategy for for eliminating ants getting into my house. I had another question. What about the uh, um, the, the benefit the biological controls for white grubs? How effective are they in Oklahoma? Yeah. Um, so really. This is still more largely in the realm of, um, of research. Um, we do know there are parasitoids. We do know there are predators. Even fire ants are predators of <laughs> white grubs, for instance. Um, the, the trick is how do we encourage their numbers? How do we em employ them in a biocontrol program for white grubs? That's been, that's been the trick and it's, and it's very difficult. And it's pretty much out of our hands as homeowners and, and home, um, you know, lawn, home lawn care type things, even, you know, professional lawn care, they're not going to be employing biological control. But um, there are things like nematodes we talked about already. Um, um, there's a, a different uh, group of nematodes, not the Steiner nema, um, but the uh, heterorhabditis. It's a different genus of, um, of, ne of entomopathogenic nematodes that affect white grubs. They've been looked at extensively and they can be used. Quite, the problem there is we don't have a lot of commercially available nematodes for that use. Um, but there are some microbial uh, pesticides as well, like the um, insect killing fungi um, that, that have been looked at that could potentially be used. Um, it's just, it's, it's, you can kind of see where I'm going here. There's not a lot available either commercially or practically uh, for, for use as biocontrol agents against, against white grubs. Okay. Do nematodes that attack grubs also attack worms? So uh, Pat, I'm, a, I'm assuming that you're referring to earthworms here. Um, no, they don't. They, they, the nematodes are pretty specific to, um, to arthropod uh, pests. So, um, you know, the larvae of fungus gnats, uh, white grubs below the soil, uh, root aphids, things like that. They're, they're not going to be attacking um, earthworms. Okay, anybody else have any other questions? We're a little after two o'clock. I appreciate everybody hanging in there and joining us today. Um, I was just gonna ask you, Eric, uh, when are you coming out with the short film of the attack of the aphid mummies? Oh yeah, well, I'll tell you what, <laughs> you know, the, the videography is definitely not one of my skill sets, but um, YouTube, if you go on YouTube, you will find an abundance of different <laughs> videos of, of parasitoids attacking insects, um, from aphids to caterpillars, I mean, you name it, you name the pest, you can probably find a video of a parasitoid that's attacking it. YouTube is a wonderful tool um, because we don't, you know, it's hard to observe this in nature, right? But so it's, um, it's hard to observe ourselves. You have to sit out in your garden patch for a long time to, to observe this, this behavior. So, um, so you'll find videos of predation, parasitism, you name it, lots of options out there on YouTube and probably some other uh, sources. BBC has some. National yeah. Geographic uh, TV has some. Um, lots of cool videos out there that you can use. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to put that into a, 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 a presentation like this. There's just not enough time to view a yeah. 10 minute clip on, on parasitism. So, oh, and there's also cool videos on um, how pathogens work against insects too. So some pretty grim uh, subject material, but, you know, I'm a biologist. I love it. It's cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, if that's all the questions, again, I'd like to thank Eric and hope you guys will tune in next week. We actually have um, kind of a, a fun, I think, a fun topic. It's going to be unique. 
and uh, kind of specialized, but we'll be talking about um, vegetable grafting or grafting vegetables. What, why, and how? And this will be presented by Bijan Hu, a new faculty member of our department who was just hired um, to, to um, help us with uh, in state in terms of um, urban horticulture, small farms, farmers market folks, and things like that. So she's, she's really sharp, really great, and we're going to be excited to uh, have her present next week. So, all right, if that's it, we'll see you all next week, hopefully. Thank Sounds you. Great. All right. Thank you all. Thanks, Appreciate Eric. it. Yeah. Okay.